it's 24 seven. It's not ending. There's no end in sight. It's just a lot of uncertainty and that's a lot of toxic stress. And that's where it does have a toll on our bodies. But when it's 24 seven, then we get, everything gets dysregulated, right? It's wear and tear on our cardiovascular system. It disrupts our immune system, increasing inflammation. It disrupts our metabolism. It's very disruptive when we're under 24 seven stress. Hi everyone. Welcome to episode 27 of Two Docs Talk, Better Living for a Better Life. I'm Rob Hoyer, joined by my co-host, Abbas Shafi. Abbas and I have been talking about doing an episode on stress. We'd like to send a shout out to Dr. Larry Cohen, who was a previous guest on the podcast, for introducing us to Dr. Sheila B. Dr. B is an internist in Colorado Springs who has decided to focus on her practice on lifestyle medicine with a special interest in stress management. Dr. B completed her undergraduate and medical school at the University of Kansas and went on to complete her residency at University of Michigan. We cover lots of aspects about stress in this interview. We discuss why Dr. B elected to focus her practice on lifestyle medicine and specifically stress. We go into what is stress, different types of stress, including eustress, which is also known as good stress. We talk about how to identify when stress becomes harmful and how to recognize stress. Dr. B also gave us some techniques for how to start managing stress that we can put into practice right away, including a technique called the relaxation response. We so enjoyed speaking with Dr. B that we asked her to come back for a second podcast where we delve into her stress management program and we'll also get to do some meditations that she recommends for managing stress. Without further ado, here's our interview with Dr. Sheila B. Sheila, we're so, we're so happy to have you on Two Docs Talk. Uh, welcome and uh, um, just uh, uh, thrilled to have you here. Um, we, we just, uh, you know, we we uh, learned that you had changed your your practice focus uh, to lifestyle medicine and fo- specifically focus on on stress management. And just would love to hear a little bit about how that how you made that transition and what was the pivotal moment that made you say, okay, I'm going to focus on lifestyle medicine and stress specifically. So, um, you know, for a long time, I really tried to emphasize preventative medicine and everything we can do with lifestyle in the office, but um, it just didn't get a whole lot of traction, right? Um, It seemed like patients were coming in and they just really wanted a prescription to fix everything. Um, And I just got more and more frustrated with it. And I got to the point where I felt like you know, our health is this roof over our heads, right? And so we've got this roof over our heads that's our health. And and we want to try to prevent water from coming in and, and soaking the floor, right? Ruining the floor. And I felt like what was happening in medicine was we were getting a lot of leaks in the roof, right? So there are a lot of issues with the health. But But what we were doing was we were just going around with little buckets, right? And so we started out with little wooden buckets to collect to collect different uh, leaks from the ceiling. And then we we moved up to stainless steel and then we moved to silver and bronze and gold. And now we've got ruby line titanium buckets and diamond line golden buckets. And we have all these really expensive buckets, which is really cool science, right? The, The science behind all these medications is really cool, but we've got very expensive buckets collecting water from the ceiling to keep it off of the floor, but nobody's fixing the roof, right? And so we're spending tons of money, like over $600 billion a year on pharmaceutical drugs a year, right? So we're spending all this money, but we're not fixing the problem. And I just got really frustrated with it. And um, I got to the point where there was yet another diabetes drug that came out and I just said, that's it. I can't, I can't do it anymore. Right. I can't keep just prescribing these medicines and we're not actually dealing with the problem at hand. And so I just decided I was going to make the leap and I decided I was going to only do lifestyle medicine and really helping people dive in and what they can do with their sleep, stress management, social connections, uh, substances, nutrition, and exercise to try to prevent and reverse chronic disease. That's, am- that's amazing. You also went to the culinary school, right? Uh, I did some culinary, I would diet as well. Oh, yeah. So um, I, I went to a, a conference in Napa, and it was called Healthy Kitchens, Healthy Lives. And it was such a great conference. And it was so exciting to see all these 
physicians working with dietitians and chefs and nurses and physical therapists and all these people all working together to try to help patients make healthier choices. So I went to that and I was super excited about that. I love cooking. And so then I did a culinary medicine um, certification and that was really fun and cool. And I learned a lot. And, and so when I first decided that I was going to move into more lifestyle medicine, I thought I would be doing a lot more nutrition and culinary medicine. But what I discovered was, is a lot of people, they know what to do, but knowing what to do and actually doing what, you know, does, it's not the same, right? So I always say knowledge, knowledge isn't power. Knowledge is just knowledge. The power comes from having the skills and the strategies to actually implement that knowledge. And so I found people, they'd come to me and they'd want some, some advice and some stuff, some, some help with nutrition and cooking. And so we do some really fun things in the kitchen. It's great. But then um, we're just, we're just taken off, uh, off course by the simplest things. And so I use the example of my cousin came in town because I might see somebody, we talk about these changes they could make. They set some goals. They're on their way. We meet in two weeks. They're meeting their goals. And then I'll check back in in a month and they'll say, well, you know, my cousin came in town and I just got off track and I just haven't been able to get quite back on yet. And so then I realized that number one, we're so easily taken off course. And then number two, um, there are so many reasons that we we make the choices we make, right? So we eat for lots of things other than just hunger. And um, and that's where I realized, okay, wait a second, we really need to get, I need to help patients get to the root of what's going on. And that's where I found really stress management is key in in making that happen and getting that started. Yeah, I think the stress is the mother of all of this you know, illnesses, habits, and, you know, think that's what we do. So, so what, can you explain to what is stress? What is, what is just the definition and, you know, some stress are good, some not. So just maybe for our audience, you know, what's your thought of the stress it is? So you can think of stress as anything that, that upsets your equilibrium, right? Or anything that, um, that is a, is a threat to your, to your system or to your body. So we think of stress evolutionarily as being a threat to our physical existence, right? So stress is the stress response, at least we bring about when, for instance, um, as we evolved, if we were to meet a mountain lion or a tiger or a bear or anything like that, there was a physical threat to our existence. We would have this stress response that we would need to respond to, right? We need a fight or flight. We need to, you know, gear everything up, turn up that sympathetic nervous system so that we can run away, survive, and go back to the safety of our cave. But now our stressors aren't typically physical threats to our existence. Sometimes they are, but typically not. But these days, our, our stressors are perceived threats. So when we feel like we're not in control or we believe that we lack resources to manage a situation, we feel threatened. And there's a lot of things that we're not in control of, right? So there's things that we're not in control of in our daily life, at work, at home, it, it, a lot of things like that, right? And then there's things like existential things, like the climate and the planet and everything else that we are not in control of. Or, and then resources can be time, money, um, support, experience, knowledge, all of those things. So, you know, if I'm, if I'm at my job and I feel like I'm not in control of what's going on and I don't have the resources, I don't have the, the competency to do what I'm expected to do, or I don't have the time to finish the task that's, ex that's expected of me, that's a perceived threat, right? So it can be when you feel like you're not in control, you don't have the resources to manage. We feel threatened and we dial up that stress response. And we don't even need a real situation happening to get into that stress response. We can simply have a thought, right? And, and I always say one thought begets another thought, another thought, another thought, another thought. And pretty soon we have all these thoughts swirling around in our head. And there's not a complete sentence there, but there's a lot of unease in our body, right? Because all of these thoughts, whether it's ruminating on the past or worrying about future uncertainty, that also triggers the stress response. So 
our stressors these days are typically when we feel like we're not in control, we lack the resources to manage, or we're ruminating on the past or worrying about the future. So those so, are stressors. But you ask about like like good stressors or bad stressors. Right. Yeah. So so that's I think a key point is that stress isn't all bad, right? I mean, stress doesn't exactly. have to lead to distress. Stress can lead to growth. And in fact, if we didn't have stressors in our life, we would never get better at anything, right? And so we need stressors to, to grow and be better. Um, so we have to be able to view things instead of viewing something as a threat, we view it as a challenge, right? right. And so for instance, um, like the example of good stress, um, one of my daughters did a half Ironman uh, triathlon. And so she was physically stressed. She put her body through physical stress, trying to run, bike, and swim more and more every day training, right? So that was physical stress for body that she, she got stronger from it, right? So she got physically stronger. And then during the race, she had psychological stress because she had over a mile in an open water swim with all these sea lions going everywhere, right? So she had psychological stress from that. And then she, um, got her back went into spasm on the bike ride. And so she, um, she was in pain. She didn't know if she was going to be able to finish. She finished the, the half marathon by, she would walk a minute and then she would jog a minute and she would walk a minute and she would jog a minute. So she had both physical and psychological stress, but she grew so much from that experience because she gained, um, you know, first of all, she got stronger. Second of confidence. all, she, yeah, confidence that and persistence, right? Yeah, I can do this. I just have to keep going. And so that's a good example of, you know, you stress or good stress where you can grow from it and you end up better off um, because of what you went through. I think that you stress is like, if you don't have you stress, we would not was that achieve our goal. We do not go forward, like passing a test. You know, exactly. we hard. We have to have that, that otherwise, you know, we'd be flunking all the tests. Who, who cares? So, so I think a lot of this, you said, depend how you, how you re receive the, the, or how you digest that stress and how you use it. And so, so what are the non or the harmful stress that I mean, this, mostly there are thoughts that we, we just destroy our body. Is that correct? Um, so toxic stress, um, toxic and chronic stress is really detrimental to our mental and physical health, right? So toxic stress would be things like, um, you know, like living in a home with, with violence, right? So that's a toxic stress. Um, stress can also be toxic um, when, when we, or for instance, I think of situations of caregivers, right? So as an internist, I took care of a lot of patients with dementia. And, and caregiving is such a stressful situation because you are not in control. You cannot control this disease. Um, there aren't enough resources really to help, right? I mean, we can try, but resources are, are slim there. And, um, and it's 24 seven, it's not ending. There's no end in sight. It's just a lot of uncertainty and that's a lot of toxic stress. And then obviously trauma is toxic stress as well. Um, and that's where it does have a toll on our bodies um, because we're not intended to be in this fight or flight 24 seven, right? And so when we take a state like this sympathetic nervous system response to stress, right? That is intended for an acute stressor, something that we can fight or flee, we can run away, we can survive. Um, but when it's 24 seven, then we get, everything gets dysregulated, right? So it's wear and tear on our cardiovascular system. It disrupts our immune system, increasing inflammation. It disrupts our metabolism, um, our hormones. So it's very disruptive when we're under 24 seven stress. Um, but that's, I think back to your point, the first point of some stressors, it's pretty hard to just change your mindset on, you know? Um, you can't just, if you're living in a traumatic situation, you can't just change your mindset and make it okay. Um, but there are other situations where it is all about mindset, right? And if we can see an opportunity as an opportunity for growth, as a challenge, as opposed to a threat, then we can turn something that maybe was not great for us into something that can actually lead to growth. What's allo stress? 
Or allostasis, I'm sorry. Yeah, so allostasis is this idea that our bodies are going to change to respond to um, uh, the situation at hand, right? So for instance, in a stress response, um, if we have a stress, if we have something that we need to respond to, then we need to gear up and have that stress response, right? And so our bodies are going to adjust to what needs to happen at that time. But when we have that day in and day out, or it never ends, then we go into allostatic overload because, and that's where it's, that's just not the way our system was designed. Um, and so allostasis is that the ability of our bodies to change, to respond to a situation appropriately. And, but then when we get too much and it doesn't end, then we can go into allostatic overload, which is just the chronic wear and tear of, of stress on our physical and mental health. One of the things I love, Sheila, about your approach is it's so patient-centered. And I'm, I'm just curious, when you work with patients, um, what do you see as common causes uh, of stress? Is it is there some themes that, that emerge or something that you can, because it, it, clearly you've talked to many people about you stress, harmful stress, or, or um, other other types of stress. Um, what what do you think are the some of the big, the big big ones? So, um, I would say one of the big things is um, we overcommit, right? So we try to sometimes take on too much, and when we take on too much, um, we only have so many resources. We only have so much time in the day. We only have so much energy, and then when we realize we've overcommitted. Um, and then we're stressed because I made these commitments to people and I want to honor these commitments, but I do not have enough time in the day to do all of this. Right. And then we feel guilty about it. And, um, and then, and then, and then things just start to go downhill from there. Right. And so I think overcommitment is a big thing, um, because every time we say yes to something, we have to say no to something else. But we don't think about that in the moment, right? We just keep saying yes, yes, yes. And then and then it comes down to it and we're like, oh shoot, I can't do all of this, right? And then we feel overwhelmed and stressed. So I think overcommitment is big. Another big one is um, you know, being able to sit with uncertainty. And people want so badly to control their lives and control their future and control everybody and what everybody's doing in their life, right? And to be able just to sit with uncertainty is really difficult. But I think we have to accept the fact that I can't control what my 18-year-old daughter does, right? That is out of my control. I can, I can try to influence a situation in a positive way, but for me to spin on what she might be doing and how things might go wrong in the worst case scenario, that is unnecessary suffering I'm bringing on myself, right? And so that happens with, I mean, anybody who has children, you worry about your children, right? And I'm not saying never worry about your children, but I think that we all have to come to something where we have to say, okay, you know what? I'm going to do the best I can with the resources I have. And, and then I'm going to try to pay attention. And if I start, if I find myself worrying about uncertainty and all of a sudden I'm catastrophizing and I have this stress response in my body where I can feel it. Right. So, you know, I get, you get a phone call, you get a text and immediately your mind just goes to the worst place. And, you know, you start clenching, your throat feels tight. Maybe you get palpitations. You, you notice you're not breathing, your stomach feels upset. So all of these things where we just bring it on ourselves because we start with, we, we get into what are called cognitive distortions, right? So um, we, we get into all or nothing thinking, we, we um, discount the positive, we use a mental filter and focus on the negative, we think we're mind readers, and we know what someone else is thinking, we think we can tell the future, we then we start catastrophizing, right? Um, so a good example of this is um, even myself as a as an MD. Um, so years ago, I had some some health issues. And, um, and I got a phone call, right? from Penrod radiology about my mammogram, right? I kid you not, I am planning my funeral. And, and that's how we can go from just a thought, right? To this huge stress response. And it's all because it's just thought, 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 thought. And before you know it, we've created this catastrophe in our mind. 
And that is creating stress in our body. And it's just unnecessary suffering. And so to be able to recognize, oh my goodness, this is what I'm doing. I don't need to be doing this, right? So those are some of the stressors that people bring on themselves when, when they can't accept that they can't control other people. They can't control some situations. Um, when, when we don't pay attention to what our resources are and we overextend ourselves. And you know, when, when researchers study people who are stressed, they use something called a perceived stress scale. And the perceived stress scale doesn't actually have anything to do with what's going on in your life. It has to do with, do you feel like you're in control and do you have the resources to manage? Do you feel like I've got this, right? Do I feel I have some agency here? And, and so there's a lot of people who are in very dire situations and they, and they do quite well, right? And then there's other people that are so stressed out and you talk to them about what they're stressed about and they tell you and you're thinking, wow, you know, those are some heavy feelings for something that really in the scheme of things is not that big of a deal, right? I see that every day in my practice. Same here. So living with imperfection, um, you know, I, you know, I travel a lot in this country. People, they want to be perfect all the time, but our human body is, is we, we, we take stress. We, we the, uh, there's a, a roomy, um, a beautiful poet. He says, um, the house guest, he said, we are just a house guest. Every yes. morning is a new thought, every new thing you have to learn how to de-stress. I mean, in my practice, I see people with cancer and they're doing so well and they're so hopeful and we actually uh, interview um, one of uh, Rob's patients about, you know, he has so many cancers, but at the same time I see with the irritable bowel syndrome and they just live a quality life so poorly and you try to just, you know, you don't have to be perfect, you know, every morning you don't have to, you know, have tons of stimulus and sleeping aids to sleep and your body be perfect. You have, this is how, uh, is, can you elaborate on those physical effects of the stress on the body? What are you, what are the common things that you think that is the, the key corner from stress? Yeah. So uh, I'm just going to start from the head and go down. So headaches, right? Headaches are huge. Um, jaw tension, uh, clenching, um, which can lead to headaches and TMJ and other things like that. So jaw tension is big. Um, talk about GI distress, right? GI is huge. So irritable bowel syndrome affecting also other things that I'm sure you can talk about way more than I can. But I remember last summer, there was a position paper, paper actually from um, gastroenterology, I don't know, some big uh, society about using mind-body interventions to treat these functional GI issues. Um, so GI issues are huge. Um, chest pain, um, you know, that's a huge one. Even things like I had a woman who had recurrent hives and it was related to stress. She was in a she was in a toxic relationship and she had recurrent hives related to to the chronic stress she was under. Um you know, inflammation, um insomnia, depression, anxiety. I mean all of those things. If you think about like all the things that I would see as an internist, so many of them were related to stress and our inability to manage um, just our day-to-day -day challenges. I think, uh, Abbas, you have, do you have the next question about uh, treatment, I believe? Um, well, um, I was going to you, you had treatment. Also, you had some brief, if you can go through a brief technique of just one, recognizing the stress and how to approach stress and then followed by the treatment. So I think recognizing stress, I think, is one of the key things. Many of my patients, they they think that's there, but you know they, they do not recognize and they're laying, they go to neurologists, they have, you know, migraines, they go to rheumatology, they have fibromyalgia, then they come to me. And mm -hmm. when I see these things and I says, go to the source and they just want to, as you said, the bandaid or the bucket under the water, but they, 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 they say, oh, my life is just fine. And they, so, so one is recognition and of course, treatment. Yeah. And I think, um, so like recognizing, so recognizing stressors and, um, and recognizing the stress response. Um, so two different things, right? So I think recognizing our stress response, so many of us just go through our day and we don't even really pay attention to what's going on in our bodies, right? 
um, where, you know, you can go through your whole day and people are clenching their jaw all day long and they don't even, they're, they're not even in touch with it. Right. Or they can be like this with their shoulders up here, um, and clenching their whole body and they don't even recognize it. So being able to recognize like, what, what are my stress responses, responses, right? What, what happens to me? What happens to me physically? Um, you know, throat tight, tightening, uh, chest discomfort, chest tightness, feeling short of breath, feeling like you can't take a deep breath. Um, so recognizing those things that are personal to you and then going through and kind of, again, right, trying to look at what are the things that I think about, right? Um, and then going through and thinking about those stressors and then kind of going through and, and marking what's in my control and what's not in my control. And then thinking about, okay, which of these things are a big deal and which of these things are not a big deal? And then it's just a really good exercise to say, okay, you know what? I'm spending a lot of time thinking and worrying about this thing that I realize right now is not in my control. And in the scheme of things, it's really not that big of a deal, right? Um, and so I think just being able to sit down and actually think through that, um, because too often we have these thoughts that come up and we may ruminate on those thoughts, but we're really not being intentional and working through that thought process. Does that make sense? Definitely. Um, yeah, we're just spinning on it. And so being able to take the time and instead of just spinning on something and kind of spinning out of control, being able to sit down and intentionally say, okay, what am I thinking about? Um, and, you know, how, where am I going to go with this? What are the patient can do themselves and when they should ask for help? Can you sort of define a sort of what home remedy or what a personal is? Of course, it's state of mind. I mean, you have to know how much you do and when to seek help. Right, right. Um, so let's see. One thing, so one of the first exercises we do in um, the stress management class is we work on this energy battery. And I think of this also as a reservoir of resilience. So for instance, if I'm going to try to manage what comes at me during the day, I need to start out with a full battery, right? So one of the first things I think is to think about what charges my battery? How can I set myself up for success so that I'm going to be able to handle whatever comes at me today, right? I don't know what's coming at me today. But how can I set myself up for success so that I can handle whatever life brings? And then you start to think about, okay, what charges my battery? If I get good sleep, I wake up in the morning and I'm much in a much better state to handle whatever comes at me, right? If I start my day um, maybe with some time alone and maybe some exercise, I'm also going to start my day in a, in a position to handle whatever comes at me. Um, so there's sleep. There's uh exercise, um, there's healthy eating, right? If I am eating well and I'm maintaining a nice, even blood sugar, I'm not going up and down, right? Um, then that's also going to help me be able to handle whatever comes at me. We know social support helps um, temper our stress response and helps speed our recovery from stress. So social connections. And then avoiding risky substances, right? If, if I, let's say, let's, let's just create the worst scenario, right? Let's say that um, I went out last night and I had three glasses of red wine with dinner and I had a really good time and I had a nice big meal late and we stayed out late and I got home and I fell asleep right away, but you know what? I'm going to wake up at two o'clock in the morning feeling horrible and not sleeping from those glasses of red wine and a big meal at night, right? So my sleep's going to be fragmented, which means in the morning, I'm going to wake up sleep deprived. Um, I'm not going to have the energy to work out. I'm going to be more likely to grab that sugary, fatty breakfast, right? Than something healthy. And because I'm sleep deprived, I'm much more likely to view whoever comes in the kitchen first as being threatening, right? And so then I'm going to rise up to this threat coming in and then, and then the whole day just goes downhill, right? 
So that's what I mean about setting yourself up for success, knowing what do I need to do so that whoever comes in the kitchen first or whoever I meet at work first, that I'm going to be able to handle whatever that is, as opposed to the first person I meet, I, you know, they say something to me and I take as offense, offensive, and then the gloves are off and, you know, it's just a whole stress response, right? So that's kind of a tangent. But I guess my point is, is one of the first things to do is set yourself up for success and know for you personally, what charges your battery? What's going to help you be your best self today and handle whatever life gives you? So that's the first thing I would say is setting yourself up for success. Could you talk a little bit, Sheila, about the relaxation response and also how to meditate? Sometimes when I meditate, my mind tends to wander. It's so it's so weird. It just kind of goes off and like <laughs> I try and try and try and like 10 seconds, it's off on something else. How, yeah. how, do, how, how can we do this better? Okay. So uh, before I get to the relaxation response, we'll just give you an A plus for being human because um, about about almost half the time our minds wander, right? So we're doing one thing and our mind is someplace else. And, and the interesting thing is, is that if we are trying to sustain focus on a task, we're using our frontal lobe, right? We're using executive function, frontal lobe, sustaining attention, working on this task. And then our mind wanders. And when our mind wanders, it goes off to this place that, that the, the neurologists call the default mode network. And the default mode network is all about self-referential thought. It's all about me and what's happening in the world and how does it relate to me, right? And we can get really lost in the default mode network, right? That's where ruminations happen. That's where craving happens. That's where all of that just random thoughts happen, right? But then we have another area of our brain that's like, oh, no, that's, that's not where you wanted to be, right? Come on back over here to the frontal lobe, right? So when we do the relaxation response, the two steps of the relaxation response, which counter the stress response. So in the lab, we know that we have a physiologic stress response, right? Um, when we measure, when we look at people, when they elicit the relaxation response, we see an exact opposite of that, right? So in the stress response, we see increased heart rate, blood pressure, breathing, heart rate variability changes, uh, catecholamine, cortisol, all of that, right? It, when we elicit the relaxation response, we see heart rate goes down, blood pressure goes down, breathing slows, change in heart rate variability, lots of changes in the body, right? Cortisol comes down. So the relaxation response, the two steps to eliciting it are number one, focusing on our breath and linking our breath with a word, a phrase, or a movement. So for instance, I am, I'm seated comfortably wherever you want to sit comfortably, right? You can sit on the floor, you can sit in a chair, you can be outside, whatever, right? Um, I like to close my eyes. Um, when I do a focused attention meditation, I close my eyes. And I, um, I start just by settling into the breath, right? So I just notice my breath, just notice the breath coming in, notice the breath coming out, notice the breath as it moves in through the nose, down the back of the throat, everything, right? Just noticing the whole cycle of breath. So I kind of settle into the breath and then I normally settle into the body. So I just take note of what does my body feel like, right? Where am I? Am I'm just asking the question. I'm not judging. I'm just asking, what does my body feel like, right? Um, and then I settle into the heart. And then that's where I link my breath with a word of phrase right? So maybe I'm breathing in patience, breathing out kindness. I breathe in patience, I breathe out kindness, right? And I repeat that over and over again, right? And then my thoughts wander. And I think of some random thing over here, right? And then I gently bring awareness right back to patience and kindness, patience and kindness, breathing in patience, breathing out kindness. And if my thoughts wander 100 times in five minutes, I just gently bring it back 100 times in five minutes. And I bring my awareness back with kindness without judgment, with gentleness, maybe even a little humor, right? And, and the idea is that the, the, what the relaxation response does is twofold. Number one, we calm the body and we calm the mind, right? This mind-body connection. And when we pay attention to our breath and we start to intentionally slow the breath, we go into this more parasympathetic dominant state. 
And so just slowing and watching the breath takes us into this parasympathetic dominant state. And then that tells the brain that we're safe, right? So, you know, the vagus nerve sends 80% our, our signals going back up to the brain, giving signals about what's going on in the body, right? So our body tells our brain we're in a safe spot. We're calming our body with this mind-body connection. And the second thing that the relaxation response does is it we build we build connections in the brain, right? So neuroplasticity. So the brain is going to change in structure and function according to what we do. And every time we're focusing our awareness on our breath, our mind wanders, we notice our mind waters and we bring it back. We're building a connection away from the default mode back toward our frontal lobe. And so the more connections we have going that direction, being able to reorient awareness that helps us in a number of different areas, right? Because when we're trying to see a situation and, and looking at the situation, if we want to see this situation that we've previously seen as a threat, and we want to flip that so that now, instead of seeing what we don't have control of, we see what we do have control over. Instead of seeing what resources we don't have, we focus on what resources we do have. Now, instead of this, seeing the situation as a threat, we see the situation as a challenge, right? And, and so, and so the, these exercises are basically brain exercises, right? And so if it's difficult at first, it's because like learning any new exercise, it's difficult and we have to keep practicing, right? And so the more we practice, the better we're going to get. So the relaxation response, that was a long ramble. I'm so sorry, but the relaxation response counters the physiologic effects of stress. So it is the opposite of the stress response. And we elicit that by focusing our thoughts on a word, a phrase, or a movement, noticing when we have these intruding thoughts, and then reorienting awareness with kindness, with, without judgment, with gentleness, back to our breath and our word or phrase. I was going to make a comment. You know, I travel around the world, but the, the, in West, the relaxation technique is too rigid. When you, when you go relax, like in the wood or walking in the garden, or just you could be in the middle of trying to appear, you have to accept some of those. Your mind sometimes takes you to a wonderful place. You have to let it to ultimate relaxation. Just let your mind go and sometimes take you a, a you know, happy place. You know, even you're in the middle of the search, you can think of a nice beach or forest or something that from your childhood make you feel better. So I know I had a friend of mine that he was so stressed and his wife sent him to um, meditation and I was so excited to talk to him. And I says, how was it? He was so mad that his wife made him over there. He says, I see that these people have nothing to do. And they just, and I says, well, that's the part of the thing to think, relax and think. He couldn't get it at all. I mean, he was so, he thought he just, there's like a, again, a, a step A, two, three, there, then you boom, then you get to that, that magic moment. That's not such a magic moment. You just have to practice it and you can be anywhere that today, I mean, there's a very important to follow certain steps, but also you have to let your mind go. And as you said, being always, you know, avoid the bad thoughts and bring the good thoughts. And, and eventually it takes years, it takes generational things to be to that level of mindfulness. Yeah. And, and to that point of, you know, relaxation. So there are other there are other ways that we can bring this about, right? So we can have a focused attention meditation, which is what I just described, but you can also do open monitoring meditation. And so open monitoring meditation is like forest bathing, right? And so forest bathing they do in Japan, and it's actually been shown to lower blood pressure and increase parasympathetic tone and decrease amygdala tone. And so it's going out into your beautiful, usually a nature environment, right? Keeping your eyes open and just being completely open to everything that comes into your experience, right? So taking in everything you see, what you hear, what you can feel, what you can touch, if you can smell or taste anything, and it's being completely open to your environment. And, and, and in the same way, if you notice that your thoughts get stuck on something, right? Then you just kind of let go of that thought and allow it to rest on whatever is in your environment. And when Colorado, we live in such a beautiful place that um, you know, it's a great place to do this. So going out into the forest and just sitting and just being 
in the forest is another way to meditate. You can also meditate using moving meditation like yoga or Tai Chi, right? And it's just focusing your breath with your movement. So you, you know, you are in mountain pose, you raise your arms, you breathe in, you exhale, you fold, you know, so linking your breath with your movement and keeping your awareness on this present moment. That's the other thing too, right? You're trying to keep your awareness here to this present moment, noticing when your mind wanders and gently bringing it back. Do you have any interesting cases? I, I just, uh, it, it seems like there's th this topic uh, we could probably go on for hours about that, which is wonderful. This is so interesting and fascinating. I just wonder if you have any examples of um, maybe someone who didn't quite realize how much stress they were under and they, and they got um, some uh, recognition of that and then some treatment and some, uh, some uh, approaches to deal with that. And they perhaps um, were able to, to better um, manage those stressors. Yeah. So, um, so I had a patient and he came because he wanted to look at lifestyle medicine to help him lose weight. And so his, his chief concern was he, he needed to lose weight. So we went through the entire lifestyle medicine evaluation. And so we talked about all six pillars of lifestyle medicine and how they really do affect everything else, right? Our sleep affects our weight, our stress affects our weight. And so we talked about all the different ways that these pillars of lifestyle medicine influence um, weight, because that was his main concern. And so and he had a lot of room to move as far as improvement with diet and exercise to help him lose weight. So at the end of two hours, I said, so what do you think you, your first goal needs to be to help you, you know, on your path to losing weight? And he said, I think I need to shut off my computer at eight o'clock and I can't look at my computer again until the next day when I've had a chance to take a shower and sit down and eat breakfast. So we didn't talk about what he was going to eat for breakfast. We didn't talk about what he was going to eat at all. But I think he recognized in that moment that he was in a stress response from the moment he woke up until the moment he shut down his computer and tried to then go to sleep. And so then he realized that um, I'm, I'm in the stress response all the time, right? And that is not good for, you know, it just affects everything else, right? It affects my metabolism, affects what I'm eating and how I'm eating and all of this, which is affecting my weight. It's affecting my sleep and my sleep is affecting my weight. And so, you know, so then he just saw how everything intersects. And so he realized that he needed to at least give himself 12 hour break from emails and the expectations of everyone else, because he was feeling, you know, like I, I'm not in control. I don't have the resources to manage. There's all this work to be done and I don't have enough time to do it. And so just being able to shut down the computer at eight o'clock and then start his day, like what we talked about setting yourself up for success, right? So being able to start his day by taking a shower and sitting down and enjoying breakfast before he launched into work, he just was able to then start making other small changes that then helped him lose weight. I love that example. That's so interesting. It's, it's, it's a it's a weight loss counseling via lifestyle medicine <laughs> with a with with no actual dietary counseling. I love it. I love it. That's that's so interesting. Um, uh, um, uh, Abbas, do you have any other questions? I have me. thousands of questions, but I think, <laughs> how about you give a, a little brief, what, how your program works and some information, and I'm hoping maybe next time, uh, maybe in a couple of weeks can get together and just go more detailed on your, you know, how, how a patient, you know, comes and how you step by step, you know, there's, there's a, for every problem, there's a solution, and it is, you know, if you follow the path, eventually you get to that point, so, so if you don't just give us some of the pointers about your stress management program and some information, how they can, you know, get hold of you or how we there. And then next time we'll dig into it more in detail. Sure. Um, so the stress management and resiliency training class is called the SMART course. And it was created by the Benson Henry Institute for Mind-Body Medicine at Harvard Medical School and Mass General Hospital, their psychiatry department. It's based on decades of research and, and there's uh, everything is evidence-based um, with all of the interventions that we do. 
So it is an eight week course. We meet for two hours a week for eight weeks. And every week we learn a, we learn and practice a new way to elicit the relaxation response because um, what works for me may not work as well for you, right? So we want to learn a lot of different strategies. So you have a lot of different tools in your toolbox because the other thing too is, is that what works for me some of the time, there may be a different um, method that works for me other times, right? So in the morning, I may have my seated meditation, but all during the day, I may do little mini meditations or I may be able to do more moving meditations on days where my mind is just super busy, right? And then we, so we learn and practice different ways to elicit the relaxation response every single week. The next thing we do is every week we have a stress awareness exercise. And this is to try to gain some insight. Because like I said, we um, we go through our days and a lot of times we're just checking the box, right? And we don't take the time to reflect on what what's actually going on in our head or what we're actually f- physically experiencing in our body. So it's a chance to really parse that out, right? Like really go through what does charge me? What does drain me? What are my stress responsors? Um, what are those things that trigger me? And then and then going through, we spend two weeks on what's called a coping log where we really break down cognitive distortions and stress perspectives and then how we can how we can flip that so we can find adaptive strategies moving forward, right? Because a lot of this perceived stress, it's all about your mindset. And, and if I am perceiving this as being a bad thing and this is terrible for me, I can switch that mindset and then it's going to switch um, what's going on in my body, right? Um, we also, every week, we emphasize a different pillar of lifestyle medicine that can help us build those resources so that we can we can be more resilient, right? So like we said, we want to set ourselves up for success and we set ourselves up for success by sleeping, eating healthy, getting exercise, social connections, pro-social behavior. So every week we set goals in those four areas. So um, it's, it's great. It's not a, it's not a group psychotherapy. It is a, it's an experiential learning where you gain insight into what's going on. You gain skills and strategies. And you also, you learn from other people that Stress is a universal experience. This is a shared human experience that we have. And and a lot of times stress can feel very isolating, right? I feel like I'm the only one who's going through this. I'm the only one who has these thoughts that are so disturbing to me. But then we find out that we're not, right? We're just human. And and I think that that's also really powerful. I feel like that course should be uh, taught in uh, schools it's uh it, it, I'm, I'm totally serious I, I think it should be part of our like whether it's you know elementary or middle school so kids can learn about this at a young age and then build on it as a lot of us haven't gotten any of this until we kind of hit you know post-college and then we're in the workforce and we're just you know as a, as a physician you know doing the I'm sure you both know the 80 plus hour weeks and we just go, 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 never say no and just keep on moving. And so that's- um, The focus is on problem solving and we should have this a part of serious part of medical school you know, before you get out to say, hey, mm-hmm. this is what reality it is. So, you know, fixing the gallbladder or healing an ulcer or treating cancer, it is of course very, very important, but, you know, just, just dealing with all of these more stressors, if you have a good foundation, you can deal with them better. Mm-hmm. Well, so how can we get hold of you? How the patient can reach you? So my website is sbeemd.com. So sbemd.com. Um, or, you know, my, my cell phone is on the website. It's 719-650-0399. So let's let start over again. 719-650-0399. So they can call me. I work right now. I work at Strata Integrated Wellness over at the Garden of the Gods Resort and Club. And I have only been there for about a month. 
I love it though, because I have the resources I need to be able to help patients reach their goals, right? So I can help patients where we come in and we get this big overview of lifestyle medicine and what's going on. And we talk about all the different pillars and, and where they might want to set their goals. But then I can take them over to the fitness center and they can work with the people in the fitness center to really, you know, dive into those goals. We can go down and talk with a registered dietitian if they're really wanting to um, make some changes or they have some really specialized needs. Um, and then there's, there's just a lot of other resources there to be able to help people set themselves up for success. And I teach the smart course there as well. Does someone have to be a member to be a part of your course or is it, is it like a separate, separate program? You do not need to be a member. Um, the cost is a little bit higher for non-members, but you do not need to be a member um, to have the course. Um, you can go through the course individually if you want. So I've had patients who they have a lot of very individual, uh, heavy, heavy needs. And, and sometimes for some people, it's better if they go through it individually. So you can do the course individually, or you can do it as a group, um, whatever works for you. Well, Sheila, we are so, so, thank you so much for doing this. And we are, um, are, are we, we are just so appreciative to, to get this and to get this information out to our listeners is, is so, is, is so great. So thank you again. And we're, we're so looking forward to part two of this interview where we'll talk more about the SMART program and specific uh, some specific techniques. Great. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. I enjoyed this very much. Greatly appreciate it.